Up next, we have Rajiv talking about how um, to architect so that, let's see. Oh, boom, play. I don't use Keynote. Is this good? All right. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Rajiv. I'm an engineer at Quip. Uh, and today I want to talk about <coughs> how we iterate fast at Quip, uh, building a multi platform product by sharing a lot of code across those platforms. So, if you're not familiar with Quip, <coughs> what it is is it's a productivity suite that combines collaborative documents, spreadsheets, and task lists with chat. So, as you can see here in this screenshot, on the right side, we've got a document. It's got a spreadsheet embedded inside it. But then on the left, we have this chat thread. And every document has a chat associated with it, uh, which enables you to basically do all your communication in one place so you're not sending around like document links in your email. Uh, and then we also have mobile apps as well. So we have an iOS app and an Android app. So there's a lot of challenges in building Quip. Uh, first of all, it's just a very complex product, like real-time collaboration on complex documents that include spreadsheets. Um, there's a lot of features in this product. Uh, we also want it to be portable. So if you're on the go on your mobile device, we want you to still be able to read and edit documents. Uh, and then we also want it to work offline as well. So like if you're on a plane or something, uh, on your phone or laptop, we want you to be able to still read and edit documents seamlessly without having to think about the fact that you're offline. And finally, uh, another challenge for Quip in particular is that we have a small engineering team. It's a little bit bigger now than it used to be, but a few years ago, the team was only, I think, 13 engineers, and they were shipping Quip on eight different platforms at the same time. So you can imagine like <coughs> there has to be some good design to allow you to be able to do that. And so the way our system is designed, there's a lot of really cool things that let us iterate fast and build fast in a lot of platforms. But the one I want to talk about today is how we share our front end code across different platforms. And so I've written this here as like write front end code that automatically works in all platforms. And so there's kind of two parts to this. The first part is having your code be shared across the platforms, but then the second part is like this automatically works part. And what I mean by that is on the different platforms, you have different requirements. Uh, the, the apps communicate with the server in different ways. Uh, but when you're writing the front end code, ideally, you should be able to write it once and you shouldn't have to think about what platform you're on. So you shouldn't have to like pepper your code with like if statements, like if I'm on Windows, do this, otherwise do this. So I'm gonna show you how, how we can get away with just writing front end code once and not thinking about what platform we're on. Uh, so during the talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about the overall tech stack of Quip and how it enables this. And so a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about are kind of specific to Quip, but hopefully like you guys can kind of take away the general ideas if you're building a cross-platform app. So at the very highest level, we've got the front end and the back end. And so the back end, uh, that's like the data layer that deals with the data model, saves the data into databases. And normally you'd think of a back end as like <clears throat> a set of remote servers, like an AWS or something like that. Um, but we actually think of the back end like a little more conceptually. So it's just the layer that stores data. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a remote server. And I'm gonna get more into that later. And then we have the front end, and the front end is just all of the app code, like the client code. So um, our five primary platforms are web, Windows, Mac, Android, and iOS. So the first big piece of shared code is our React UI. So for our web app, which you'd run in the browser in your desktop, uh, we write that using React in JavaScript. And this UI code is actually completely shared between our web app, our Windows app, and our Mac app. So our desktop apps are basically like very thin shells around a big web view that runs literally like the exact same code that runs in web. So that's really awesome. You can imagine like anytime you're building a feature, uh, fixing a bug or doing anything with the UI, you only have to do it once and it immediately affects all of these different platforms. On Android and iOS, we do implement those apps natively. Um, we obviously can't reuse the same UI because it's not it's not gonna fit on mobile screens well. Um, and these days there are great ways to share code at least between Android and iOS, which will save you from implementing it twice, uh, like React Native, for example. When Quip started, that was not as big of a thing, so uh, Quip is actually implemented separately in both of those platforms. 
But there's one big piece of code that's actually shared across every single platform, and that's the editor. So the editor is this like big, gnarly piece of JavaScript that deals with everything in the Quip document. So it's very complex. There's a lot of like complex ways you can edit a document. There's real-time collaboration. Uh, there's spreadsheets and uh, all this stuff you can imagine. It's kind of like the secret sauce of Quip. And this code is actually shared across every single platform. So when you're browsing through the Android app or the iOS app, uh, you're mostly going through like native screens. But when you open a document, that document is actually a web view that runs the exact same code that's running in the desktop. So this is like a huge win, obviously. You can imagine like the most complex part of your product always has the most complicated and tricky bugs. So being able to only have that code in one place and fix bugs once is really nice. Um, and I have a quick visual just to, <coughs> to kind of go over how this works. So we've got on the left side the desktop app and on the right side the iOS app. And you can see like they have a lot of similarities. Like there's the document over here and on the left we have the chat, the chat panel with the message composer down there. And iOS is similar. It kind of has like this slidey UI, so the document is kind of slid off to the right. And so you can see like on the desktop, we've got the, the chat thread and the toolbar, like all the Chrome around the document. Uh, these are all React components. And on iOS, they're native views. But then the blue part, the editor, is actually shared between them. Uh, so this is great. This kind of achieves like the first half of what I was talking about earlier, where uh, you can see from this diagram, we actually have a ton of code that's shared between multiple platforms. Uh, the React UI and the editor make up basically the bulk of our front end code besides uh, the native Java and Objective-C stuff. So that's really good. But then the second part is when you're writing this front end code, uh, you shouldn't have to think about what platform you're on. And so that's where the API comes in. So um, if you remember before, one of the constraints that we have is we want the desktop and mobile apps to be able to work offline. So that means that they need to be able to communicate with the back end in a different way than web does. Um, but you shouldn't have to think about that when you're writing the front end code. And so the way that we achieve this is by having a uniform data model as well as an API across all of our different platforms. And we do that using protocol buffers. So if you're not familiar with protocol buffers, they're a way to define structured data. So you have objects, and uh, they're easily serializable. They're very efficient to use. And another nice thing for us is when you define protocol buffers, uh, you can automatically generate code to deal with them in JavaScript, C++, and Python, which are the three languages we use. So it's pretty perfect for us. And um, here's an example of our data model. So every object in Quip is defined as a protocol buffer. So they all have like a very uniform way of being defined. Uh, for example, a Quip document would have like an ID, a title, an author, and so on. A message, like a message you'd send in a chat, would have an ID, an author, the text that you wrote. So these are just a couple examples. So our data model is unified across all the different platforms. So whether you're on the server in Python or on a client like in C++ or JavaScript, uh, you're always dealing with the exact same types of objects. And the second part of this is defining a uniform API between the front end and the back end on all the different platforms. And so I'm going to walk through a simple example. Uh, this is uh, me sending like a kind of rude message. Uh, uh, and so I'm going to send this message with this text. And I'm going to show you how this works on the different platforms. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, not, not only is our data model unified, but our data API is also unified. And we do that as well using protocol buffers. So every single call that the front end makes to the back end has a very strict structured definition like this. So when I'm sending a message, um, it goes through what we call a handler. And a handler is basically just a call that's made from the front end to the back end. So a handler consists of a request, which is the data that the front end is going to send to the back end. So in this case, the text of my message, the timestamp, and the file attachments. And then the back end will reply with a response. And in this case, it would be the message object that we looked at earlier. And this is what it looks like in JavaScript. So it's pretty simple. You just call this method call handler, and you pass in the proper request, and then you have a callback to deal with the response. So you can see here, like this code is not aware of what platform it's on, but it's actually going to do a different thing on different platforms. So on web, 
a handler is implemented as an AJAX request. So the web, the web app talks directly to our servers in AWS. So it's going to send an HTTP request to our Python servers that are going to store that data in a MySQL database in AWS. And so every handler has a function implementation in Python. So in this case, for sending a message, it takes in that request, it builds a message object, stores it in our MySQL databases, and then returns the response. Um, but then here's the part where I was talking about like the way we think about a backend, it doesn't necessarily need to be a remote server. And this is how we get the desktop and mobile apps to work offline. So what we think of as the backend for the desktop apps and the mobile apps is actually all running locally within the app. So uh, we have this C++ layer of code that's shared across all those platforms called the syncer, and that's what will actually be receiving the handler request. So instead of sending it across the network, it's just sending it across like the native interface locally to C++. And then instead of storing that on our remote databases, it'll store it on a local database in your machine uh, using level DB. And so uh, as you can see, like the handler is very similar, but it's just implemented in C++ here. So it takes in a request. Instead of storing it in MySQL, it stores it in level DB, and then it returns a response. Uh, and then the one missing piece that you're probably wondering about is, of course, like the clients have to eventually sync to the server. And so we have um, uh, in the syncer C++ library, it has a way of passively syncing data back and forth. So if you're like on a plane on your laptop sending a message to someone, that message will go through really fast. It'll look like it worked because it did. It got s saved locally. And then as soon as you get back in your Wi-Fi, that message will get synced up to the source of truth in the server. Um, so yeah, so now we've kind of achieved this goal where we can write our front end code. We have all of our desktop UIs shared between the web app and the two desktop apps. Uh, and then the most complex piece of our code, the editor, is shared by all the platforms. And then because we have this uniform data model and a uniform API, when we write the front end code, we don't have the mental overhead of having to think about special casing depending on what platform it's running on. There are a few exceptions. One is obviously like the implementation of the handlers has to be different because on web, the handlers have to be an AJAX request and on the clients, it has to talk to C++. Um, but that's only, that's a very small piece of code because every single type of handler in Quip, like saving documents, sending messages, editing your profile, they all go through like the exact same piece of code. Um, then we also have like some custom tailored product behavior on different platforms. Like one simple example is if you're double clicking an image to open it on the web, that just opens that image like in a light box in your browser. But on the Mac app, it's slightly nicer to open it in preview. So there's a couple of special cases there. And then another thing that's different on different platforms is sometimes we have to make some performance optimizations. So for example, in our Mac app, uh, <coughs> at some point, uh, the scrolling performance was pretty bad uh, because we were using a Safari web view. And I think the refresh rate was just like not fast enough. So uh, we kind of had to hook into native code to make that better. Um, but besides these small examples, most of our code is shared. And then finally, I just wanted to uh, quickly talk about something we just launched a few months ago, uh, which is called the Live Apps Platform. So Quip Documents, if you've used them before, uh, you know like you can insert a bunch of like rich things within your document, like a spreadsheet. And people really like that. So we were trying to think of like more cool things you could put inside documents. Like maybe you could put a calendar inside your document that could help you organize your work. So instead of building all that stuff ourselves, we decided like what if we make a developer platform where developers can build any app they want to put inside a Quip document? Because also a lot of companies have their own specific workflows. Like if you use like mode analytics, you want to be able to um, or amplitude analytics, <laughs> you, you might want to embed one of their graphs in your document. And so we have this platform where you can write any app you want in JavaScript. And then the really cool thing is you can uh, hook into Quip's data model, actually, that I just talked about. So when you build your app, you can insert that into a document. And then it automatically works on desktop and mobile. And it also automatically works offline and syncs. So it's pretty cool. Um, We've launched a few apps already. We have a calendar. We have like a to-do list board. Uh, you can embed things like 
Spotify playlists or YouTube videos. So if you use Quip and you're interested in checking it out, uh, it's at quip.com slash dev slash live apps. And that's it. Thanks. Any questions? I was just curious, you alluded to um, that React Native wasn't available back yeah. when you were making this. If you were to make Quip today, <coughs> would, you, would you use it? It's, a, it's tough. So one thing, we, one thing we think about a lot at Quip is um, whenever we use a third-party library, we want it to be like very, very established because if you're, you're using something like really new, like React Native may have actually existed or it might have been just starting out when Quip built their mobile apps the first time. Um, but it's really risky to use something that's just starting out because you don't know if it's going to develop like a big community. You don't know if they're going to deprecate it at some point. Um, so we usually, I mean, it's a judgment call, but I think, I personally think React Native is really great and I would probably use it right now. Um, but we'd, we'd, we'd probably like discuss that and think about like, is this going to be sustainable? Like, is React Native going to be like uh, successful in the future? And, and so we don't actually use a, a lot of third party libraries equipped. Like, React, React Web is one of the only ones we use um, because of that reason. Yeah, so I think the biggest pain point, which I didn't really talk about, is that there are release cycles for the clients. So we push to production on our servers every day of the week, um, or Monday through Thursday, not on Fridays. But then our desktop apps only get released once every two weeks, and our mobile apps get released once every four weeks. And so that can get kind of tricky sometimes. Like if you are introducing a like a new data field on the server, um, you write some what desktop code that, that uses that field. Then it'll be live, it'll go live on web and on the server at the same time, but then it may not get released at, on the Windows app for another two weeks. So you always have to think, and this is probably just a common problem in general, but you always have to think about like backwards compatibility, like making sure previous versions of the Windows app can work with the current version of the server. Um, so even though like it sounds simple to write this code, like you still have to think about those kinds of things. I, I was gonna. I, I was actually gonna ask about that in testing. And so how are there? Do you have anything built in that helps you navigate that? Um, you know, like causing a regression or something because <coughs> the code is gonna be older on iOS or something like that. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty tough. I'm not sure if we have. I, we depend a lot on error reporting for those kinds of things. So sometimes we will see like an error come up and it logs like the client version you're on. It'll be like, oh shoot, we broke like <laughs> we broke the iPhone app from like five months ago and someone's still on it. Um, yeah, it, I mean it would be it would be a pain to have to test all the different versions of an app. I mean there's some there's some things about the structure of our code that makes it hard to run into those kinds of issues like. Uh, protocol buffers, for example, like you can add a new field to a protocol buffer. So it'd be kind of like if you store your data in MySQL, it's kind of like adding a new column to your table. Um, but protocol buffers don't require running migrations or anything. You just add a new field and you can populate that field. Then it'll get sent to a client. And clients running old versions of the JavaScript will just not know about that field. So they just look, won't even see it at all. And so usually it kind of works out because it's hard to. It's hard to have errors in old clients when they just don't even know this thing exists. They just will ignore it and do what they would have done otherwise. So usually, usually it works out. So usually when you add something new, it's just kind of missing on old clients, but doesn't like throw any crazy errors. Anything else? All right, thanks. Mr. Jeep.